webinar on preparing and applying for neuropsychology fellowships. I'm Dr. Lana Harder, and I currently serve as the Abson Community Outreach Co Chair. Today, we are joined by Dr. Amy Huffelfinger, who is the Abson President and Professor of Neurology, Neurosurgery, and Pediatrics at the Medical College of Wisconsin. We also have Dr. Rob Collins, who joins us from Houston. He is the Abson President elect and also serves as the co-chair for the Abson Community Outreach Committee. He's Assistant Professor of Neurology at Baylor College of Medicine and practices at Michael E. DeBakey VA Medical Center. Dr. Liv Miller is joining us from the West Virginia University School of Medicine, where she is Assistant Professor in the Department of Behavioral Medicine and Psychiatry. Finally, we have Dr. Ann Clausen, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the Kennedy Krieger Institute. So we are excited to be here to talk about applying for fellowship. And at this time, I will turn it over to Dr. Amy Heppelfinger. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Just making sure that we can see the slides here. Hopefully, it's showing up for everybody uh, correctly. I'm so excited to be able to talk with all of you today to be able to go over um, some suggestions on how to um, think about applying for your fellowship in clinical neuropsychology, uh, answering some questions about that towards the end, and hopefully getting all students some understanding as to the process of how to apply for the match, um, what APSIN is, who APSIN is, and why um, that's important. And I will also spend a little bit of time going over uh, summarizing the literature and the supporting specialty documents regarding training standards in clinical psychology which is how you can all understand why we have the certain training requirements that we do at the postdoctoral level. So uh, thank you, Dr. Harder, for giving an introduction to me. Uh, a little bit more about what I do outside of being the APSIN president. I have been the training director for a postdoctoral fellowship at the Medical College of Wisconsin um, for about 10 years now and was the assistant before that. Our program was one of the first programs in clinical neuropsychology for fellowship training. We have a lifespan program with four adult fellows and three pediatric fellows and uh, have been a part of APSIN since um, its inception. We were one of the first three fellowships in clinical neuropsychology to be accredited by APA. Uh, so that's 14 years running now and have remained active in um, helping decide what are the training standards for um, postdoctoral fellowship in clinical neuropsychology. So the first thing that I want to make a strong point for is why would you choose to do a postdoctoral position with APSIN? Well, first of all, APSIN, what do those letters mean? Of course, all of our letters in our field sound exactly the same. So APSIN is the association for the postdoctoral programs in clinical neuropsychology. We are specific to uh, training at the postdoctoral level. And in order for a fellowship to be an APSIN training program, um, that training program goes through an actual peer review process with APSIN to verify that that program's training is consistent with um, Houston Conference guidelines, the training taxonomy, and the competencies that are required for clinical neuropsychology at the entry level. The training director for all APSIN programs is required to be um, board certified with AACN ABP in clinical neuropsychology. Uh, the other thing that's really important um, and we'll bring up a couple times during the talk as well as in the question and answer is that there is a required code of conduct for fellowship programs in APSIN regarding how we recruit and, and the fellowship experience during the training. And that's really important um, in terms of how you will experience the recruitment process. Um, so what are the perks to programs who are uh, APSIN member programs? There are a whole lot of them. One is, I don't have written down here, but we have just a great, uh, a great group of training directors who can communicate about all sorts of different um, training issues. We have training program resources for the programs, uh, including a how-to manual that goes through everything from how to apply for 
um, uh, APA accreditation at the fellowship level to um, how to develop uh, competency documents. We have written and mock oral exams that can be used by the programs. We have a video didactic series that is uh, in development and continuing in its development to provide training programs with um, didactics that they may not have the expertise on site um, to teach about. Uh, we have a mem members only listserv and we are available uh, to each other as well as to students for consultation. The perks for students, um, if you attend a postdoctoral program that is an APSIN program, you get an expedited review of your board certification application so that you can apply and uh, because APSIN has already reviewed the program and made sure that it was consistent with uh, necessary training guidelines, that first step of the board certification process is reduced in uh, length and intensity. And also, um, we can provide emergency support to students in those programs. So for example, if a training director decides to leave or if the student is having problems with uh, something that's happening at the fellowship level, they can contact us um, at APSIN to help them um, with that process. We also can provide support to the training program. So if a training program has a training director who leaves and there is no one qualified uh, to take over as training director, we can help find um, interim support uh, in that process to get that training director position covered while someone else is recruited and trained so that the uh, education continues. Another thing that we are working uh, very hard on at this point in time is uh, that we recognize that there are some issues uh, in all areas of education with providing equal and, um, and uh, making opportunities for training available to individuals who come from various different backgrounds. Um, and that's something we're aware of and we have, are working as a group and we are also uh, encouraging of providing um, equal opportunity for training for individuals who come from diverse, underrepresented and discriminated against backgrounds, um, including everything from race, ethnicity, disability, sexual orientation, gender identity, first generation college grads. We are aware that it is more difficult for individuals um, in some of these situations to be able to get training at the postdoctoral level. And while I can't promise that we have all those problems solved, we are trying as a group to solve those problems. So let's move into uh, what is the match? Because this is often a piece, a place of concern for um, students as they're applying. The match is, um, it's a program that places applicants into residency or fellowship positions at training sites in the United States and Canada. This match it occurs by a very uh, complicated and well-demonstrated algorithm, mathematical algorithm, that takes the students' ranks for where they want to go and the program's ranks for the, or for the applicants and, uh, and matches those together. The match is sponsored and supervised by APSEN and I have the websites here if you'd like to go and learn more about them. Um, and the match is administered on behalf of APSEN by the National Matching Service, or NMS. Uh, National Matching Service has worked very hard this year on changing um, the match procedures. In the past, our, our uh, agreements were still on paper. There was, it was not uh, very much online in terms of the, uh, what the programs were doing with NMS and they have worked to update all of that and it's really sleek. If you go like right now and take a look at their website, it is not fully up to date for next year, but it will be very soon. Okay, so speaking of next year, uh, for those of you who are preparing to apply for the next year's match or uh, applications, and also for those of you who are just learning about the future, which I hope some of you are, um, in terms of how to think about how to prepare years ahead for applying for postdoctoral fellowship. These dates, while the actual dates don't stay the same, the general dates do. So what's important to know is that um, right now, September, 
uh, training directors are beginning to complete or will be com beginning to complete our program agreements. I don't think that they've been sent out yet, but I heard that they are going to be uh, sent uh, very soon. And also beginning sometime in uh, September, students, you guys will see too, that you can sign up for the match with the National, National Matching Service. This occurs end of September through January. Um, then beginning in October through December, that's my range that I would encourage you to consider this, um, you want, the applicants want to apply individually uh, with the programs. So first of all, let me go back over this one more time. So as an applicant, you want to sign up for the match with the National Matching Service. On the slide before, um, here you have that website for how to go on and sign up to do that. Then what you're gonna do for uh, is review, and I'm gonna show you some different ways to think about and how to find which programs you're interested in applying to, but then you want to apply individually with most of the programs. You can look at their individual websites for um, updated information. Most of us don't have it updated quite yet in early September. I guess we're maybe mid-September now, pushing late, but like mine is not updated, it will be soon. Um, so if it isn't updated, just look again next week. We're all working on those pieces. But you can find then what you need to know about um, that program, enough information to help you decide, first of all, is there a position available? And then also, um, is it something you'd be interested in? Some postdoctoral programs, in APSIN are also participating uh, in the, uh, the APIC application streamline, like one application process like you did for internship. Um, for many reasons I'm not gonna get into yet, this is not a mandatory thing at the fellowship level. Um, and, uh, and so you probably this year will have to both apply with APIC. Um, you'll have some that will be in APIC and some that are out of APIC, so you'll have those com uh, combined applications to complete. Um, and I'll go through what you need for an application and kind of how to do that too in a few minutes. So then, um, so that's occurring uh, October through December. Many times the uh, application date falls somewhere between the middle of December and the middle of January. Um, we're a little later this year with the recruitment um, process and the deadlines as you'll see in the, uh, in the next uh, dates, but um, you really do want to try to get your applications in by uh, before their, the individual site's deadlines so that they have an opportunity to review your application fully. So then what happens is you've applied to the fellowship programs. Uh, somewhere in those first two weeks of, um, in those first two weeks of February, you are going to get messages from the individual programs, either saying that you have, are continuing to be considered for a position or you are no longer being considered for a position. You are welcome to contact sites and ask them if you are not considered, if they can give you some information about that, uh, but um, they won't always do so. So if you, for the, the ones that you are being in, Con, uh, continued to be considered, you will be invited to do an interview. Uh, the majority of us, of our programs, do interviews on the Tuesday before the International Neuropsychological um, Society Conference. So this year, that date is February 13th. We often spend uh, Valentine's Day or right around there with you guys, and uh, that's a very fun part of the year. And, and so on that day, on Tuesday, um, we have a breakfast and you should, uh, if you can and are able to come join us for breakfast before you have your interviews. Um, so then sometimes you're gonna have interviews that would be scheduled throughout that conference. Um, let's say you can't go to the conference. I think it's in Washington, I think it's in DC this year. Um, say you can't get there, you can't afford to get there, you have other uh, responsibilities. The majority of apps and programs will allow you for phone, Skype, and or on-site interviews. Don't think you need to go to an on-site interview, especially if it involves travel, but if you're in the same place, the same city or close to a place and you're really interested in them, you are welcome to see if you could go for an on-site interview. Um, and then uh, following INS, and I'll get into some of the match um, issues the, uh, and uh, how you balance 
applying through the match and applying with independent programs, uh, which is the preferred term for programs who are not, who have a postdoctoral program but are not in the match. Um, we'll talk about that and those, those uh, issues, concerns, kind of management later on in this talk. But uh, after INS is finished, then the February 22nd is your last day and our last day for submitting our uh, rank order. And then the match results will be released on Monday, March 5th. Okay. So uh, a few strategies on applying for a clinical neuropsychology fellowship uh, and ways to, or places to look. Start, or at some point in time, take a look at the APSEN website and you'll learn about our programs. Through there, each of our programs are listed with some minimal but details about the programs. Um, and uh, you can also then look on the website, the student website for the uh, Society for Clinical uh, Neuropsychology, the SCN website has a comprehensive list of programs that most of us update as well. And that will include absent programs as well as independent programs. Pretty much anybody can um, list a program there as long as they say uh, that they have a clinical neuropsychology training director that is not a verified clinical neuropsychology training director, meaning that they don't need to be board certified. Um, and no one says, oh yeah, you do actually meet criteria to be a clinical neuropsychologist. Um, but uh, but that, that list is there, it's very comprehensive. Uh, you can watch on various listservs for postings. The majority of programs are going to also submit something saying how many positions we have available, what the salary will be for the two years, as well as what our uh, individual training goals or competencies are for the programs. So then you can also look on the National Matching Service, NMS, which is going to link you back to the uh, apps and website. Um, one thing to make note of, not all programs that are going to be available in the match are actually absent programs. So even though we run the match, programs can apply and be in the match. Those programs that are not absent programs um, can vary. We do not, um, the reason they're not absent programs is they have not put forth their um, training objectives to be reviewed by APSEN to qualify. So it's not that we've reviewed them and said they don't qualify. Um, we don't really know. They have to answer a couple of questions that, that indicate that they are doing training in clinical neuropsychology. Um, so make sure you just review those maybe a little bit more carefully to make sure that they have the uh, training objectives that you need to become a clinical neuropsychologist. Um, you can contact programs directly if you have specific questions. I have an asterisk by this one because it would be detrimental to students if every single one of the students applying decided to contact every program that they're applying to with questions. That would not be um, a plus for you in your recruitment process. It would lose its meaning. Um, contact the programs that you are the most excited about if you have a real question. Um, you will have plenty of time for questions when you are interviewing and throughout that process. Okay, and I don't want it to sound like I'm totally discouraging you guys from contacting us individually. It's just um, that do it because you've got a good reason to do so, not just because you're trying to get your name out there. I'm not sure that a name out there with a question, if it's not a real question or an important question to your interview or to your uh, application process, um, is, uh, is a smart choice for students to be doing regularly. The other thing is apply to lots of programs. So people say, how many? How many programs? Well, maybe eight to 15. Some people apply to more. I would not encourage people to apply to too many less than eight. Um, I think that's a good solid number for, um, for maximizing your opportunity to find a place that's going to work for you and match with that place. Okay, so the things that are needed for most applications, again, individual sites can have differing um, application needs and uh, requirements. Uh, I'm gonna start by saying I have, a, uh, get, get, get examples from people who are successful, students that you know that got into programs that you were interested in applying to, um, so that you have that example. Um, on this page here, while I go through this, I want to mention last year after, the match, APSEN training directors uh, 
took the time to work individually with students who um, did not match last year to help kind of do a consultation around that. And one of the biggest things that we found was that um, students thought that their application materials were highlighting what was needed to do a fellowship in clinical neuropsychology, but they really weren't. And so the ways to manage that are to get samples and to have a good mentor, which I'll talk about as we go too. So you need a curriculum vitae. Highlight your neuropsych experiences, but do not embellish them. So um, we wanna know what you did. We wanna know what you learned. We wanna know who you worked with, but we don't want it to be, you know, you saw one patient with a brain tumor and then you talk about that one patient throughout your CV. Um, that would be, um, that would not help you. You need letters of recommendation, typically three, um, no more than, I've never seen anyone need more than four. And when you're getting these letters, what you wanna be thinking about are who has trained you that is a clinical neuropsychologist. That's a really important piece. So try to find somebody who is a clinical neuropsychologist probably your um, graduate school practica supervisor and your internship supervisors. Um, if you had a supervisor who was board certified um, uh, with ABPPCN, that is going to help you out um, more so than someone who is not. However, if you don't have someone who was not board certified um, or was certified by a different board, that does not mean that they are not a good uh, letter writer. So, they're better than not having someone who supervised your neuropsychological experience. You also want to have uh, someone who can represent your general graduate school performance. So maybe your, grad, your dissertation chair or your graduate school advisor. And then if you had a neuropsychology mentor, uh, so maybe you were in a situation where you did not get, you, you decided to do neuropsychology later or you did not have a ton of supervision with board certified neuropsychologists, but you've been working with someone who is a clinical neuro, a board certified clinical neuropsychologist as a mentor, they are good to write a letter as well. Um, if you don't know already, I'll put a shout out there for AACN has now established a, um, a pairing of students who are in need for neuropsychology mentors and kind of matching them up. For those of you who have several, even one, but certainly several board certified neuropsychology supervisors, that clinical mentoring program, neuropsychology mentoring program is not really for you. Don't worry about that. You'll be fine. So then you need your work samples, which should be true neuropsychological reports, which you have written. And then you need um, a letter of interest. Keep your letter of interest um, specific to what you want to do in clinical neuropsychology uh, and, uh, and what you want to do in the future proofread your work always. So many people don't, and that is a, a real dinger on our review process. Okay, so um, I'm gonna switch gears for a few minutes here now and talk through um, how do we know what training is needed to be a clinical neuropsychologist? Sometimes I'll hear students come up to me and say, you know, it's not clear what is actually needed. Well, it is actually clear. It's just not clear in terms of you need this many hundred hours of supervised experience with epilepsy or with dementia. So the history of these training guidelines are well documented. I'm not gonna go through them all, but I'm just gonna show you. They started really in 1977 when um, INS established a task force on education accreditation and credentialing in neuropsychology. This moved through for a couple of years to getting some things published. And then um, in 1987, these guidelines were published in TCN um, and su summarizing the Houston Conference Guidelines. I'm going to go into that. Hopefully you all know what the Houston Conference Guidelines are because that is um, our defining document for what we do as clinical neuropsychologists. The um, neuropsychology competencies came out of the Houston Conference guidelines and have been formulated uh, in more detail in the last several years. I will go through those in a little bit. And then also the neuropsychology taxonomy, which is the guidelines for training programs on how they can define the level of training in neuropsychology, clinical neuropsychology that they provide. Okay, so Houston Conference guidelines back in 1997 
um, which was a group of clinical neuropsychologists who got together and they decided, determined that this is what was essential for us to become clinical neuropsychologists. Um, going through from the graduate level, beginning to get your foundations of neuropsychology, um, as well as your generic psychology and clinical core. Internship extends your training in neuropsychology and completes your general clinical training and postdoctoral level. Training is really the advancement of, um, or advanced education training simply or complexly in clinical neuropsychology. So it also um, stipulated that this training at the fellowship level needs to be two years full-time. Um, that interpretation was, uh, was kind of documented and written uh, solidly by AACN and ABCN in their requirements for board certification. Um, this training is believed to be cumulative, meaning that you, there's no exact uh, way that someone becomes a clinical neuropsychologist. The, the authors of the Houston Conference Guideline wanted to make sure that there were multiple pathways to become a clinical neuropsychologist. And this is still um, preserved today, uh, although it is um, sometimes seen as a much more complex thing to do now than it was back in 1987 when there was not such structure to training programs. Um, and also, sometimes people say, well, the Houston Conference guidelines are no longer, uh, you know, they're no longer up to date. This isn't what we need for clinical neuropsychology. Um, in 2010, there was an interorganizational summit on education and training, which was an online, that administered an online survey of clinical neuropsychologists. And basically the results were, um, there were some problems with the survey, particularly that they did not have a very high response rate, but in the response rate that they had, um, there were enough people who did respond to make the following conclusions, which were that Houston Conference guidelines are widely adopted by training programs and that people who trained in training programs that were Houston Conference adherent were associated with a higher frequency of being well prepared uh, than those who were not. So um, the Houston Conference guideline continues to guide our process for training and the competencies, the entry-level competencies in clinical neuropsychology have uh, now been published and redefined to um, define the expected outcomes of your training at the fellowship level or at the entry level to, uh, to beginning your career as a clinical neuropsychologist. Uh, as training directors, those of us who take training very seriously, which is hopefully all of us, at least all the absent training directors certainly do, um, is that you, um, we only have these two years to make sure that you meet all of these uh, competencies. There is no extended level for training in clinical neuropsychology, at least in most states there's no other expectations. There's no expectations for the field that you're gonna do continuing education to further develop your skills as a clinical neuropsychologist. Um, most of us do career long continuing education to maintain our competencies, but it isn't required. So it is our job in training fellows that you are ready when you graduate from your two year uh, fellowship training to be an independent clinical neuropsychologist. So the competencies were initially um, published in 2012 by Ray Casserly, Roper, and Bauer. Um, and uh, in recent years since then, there's been a lot of interorganizational work moderated by the Clinical Neuropsychology Synarchy, which uh, has representatives from all the major neuropsychology bodies. Uh, and this, um, and what has happened is that the competencies have now been uh, established and accepted by APA uh, to, as to what is essential for postdoctoral training in clinical neuropsychology to the point that those who have um, APA accreditation at the fellowship level, which is not required, but some programs do have that, that these uh, training competencies are now what APA requires us to train to and show measurement that we do that for each of our students. Okay, so very quickly, what are those competencies? They're divided into two different parts. The first are the foundational competencies that are um, 
specific to neuropsychology as well as other psychology disciplines, and they cut across everything that we do. So this is just the general basic knowledge that um, scientific knowledge and methods and evidence-based practice is what drives everything that we do in clinical neuropsychology. Uh, we have respect for individual and cultural diversity in everything that we do. We follow ethical, legal standards and policies um, in all that we do. We work on our professional identity as a clinical neuropsychologist, and we constantly engage in reflective practice, self-assessment, and self-care. We uh, take care of our relationships with people in our field, as well as in interdisciplinary systems, as well as with our patients and the people who work around us. So those are the foundational competencies that are trained to um, in the fellowship level, as well as in graduate school, uh, which takes care of many of these basic knowledge components for these competencies. So then we have the second areas, or which is the specific areas of competency that are required for clinical neuropsychology. Um, these include neuropsych assessment, intervention, uh, which is neuropsych inter intervention. It's important that all neuropsychologists know how to do general psychology intervention as well, but at the postdoctoral level, the primary amount of intervention needs to be specific to the neuropsychological problems that patients have, similarly with consultation, that it is specific to neuropsychology. Um, the, you have to be competent to both do neuropsychology research as well as how to implement research into your work. Uh, you have to be competent to teach about clinical neuropsychology, to supervise about neuropsychology, and actually mentoring is added on this as well to mentor other individuals in the field to be competent clinical neuropsychologists. Um, we train for competencies in management and administration of the clinic, um, of our schools, of our work, of our programs. And we need to, um, I think advocacy is no longer on as a final competency, but as one of the required by APA, um, but it is uh, often considered to be something you do need to be competent when you graduate from your fellowship, to be able to advocate for your patients and for our field. Okay, so um, next I'm gonna move into the neuropsychology taxonomy. So what I just talked about was the competencies. The competency document, um, which, let me go back here for a second. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I thought somewhere I had the link to CRISP, the bottom uh, bullet here, which is where the entry level competencies are located. Uh, if you want to see them, you can um, email me and I will send them out at some point. Um, I can send them out to all of you because I don't see that link on here anymore. I must have accidentally taken it off. Okay, so the competencies is what guides training of an individual student, of each of you who are going to be applying. The neuropsychology taxonomy is um, this awesome document which is telling training programs um, specifically how to define their level of training. So the reason this was created was to, to provide a common language or framework to define training in a program. This is really important because training programs don't actually and didn't actually know before this, like how much is enough for each level of training. So this gives us um, better understanding as uh, students in particular, but also um, as people who are reviewing people's training to understand how much neuropsychology training did they get at the graduate level, at the internship level, um, and then of course what we define at the postdoc level. So this is just a greater truth in advertising. Now, there's two things, two caveats I'm going to say right now, and I'm going to say them again when I get done talking about the taxonomy. First of all, this document um, was just put on uh, into effect by APA in the last, within the last year for sure. Um, and the paper that was published by Sterling um, and a group of us with uh, uh, SCN's Education Advisory Committee uh, was published recently in the Clinical Neuropsychologist. So don't give your training programs a hard time if they haven't done this already. In fact, if you may be hearing about this before they are, you can give them the education on, hey, did you know about this? And how would you define the amount of training that you provided at the graduate level for us? Um, secondly, this taxonomy is not for students. So I'm gonna show you how you can use it to be beneficial to you, educational to you, but it does not define a specific path 
for individual students. Okay, so this is the taxonomy. I'm not sure if you guys can see my cursor because I, yeah, but if you can, great. If not, you can probably follow along. So this is what the document looks like. And along the um, left-hand column, you have the labels that a program is supposed to use. You can either say at the doctoral level that you had a major area of study in clinical neuropsychology, an emphasis in clinical neuropsychology, an experience or exposure in clinical neuropsychology. This is true also at the internship level and at the postdoctoral level. I'm gonna point out here to you, if you are applying to postdoc programs and that program is not a two year full time or equivalent, like four years half time, um, formal training program in clinical neuropsychology that includes didactics and educational opportunities, clinical opportunities, research opportunities, um, then it is not in, um, in alignment with what is required by uh, or for training for clinical neuropsychologists. It has to be two year full time. Now, people might say and do say all the time, what if our program includes, you know, a quarter time of working on a rehab unit or doing um, legal work or working in ped psych or health psych. Um, you know, there is the piece of most of those things can still be neuropsychological in nature. So you can usually practice in those ways, asking in a neuropsychological uh, approach or question versus in a different dif discipline. So you can guide that often if that is what is in there. It's great to know how to do neuropsychology in a rehab setting. It's great to know how to do the treatment that rehab psychologists will do with patients who have neuropsychological disorders, for example. Okay, so um, I'm gonna kind of go through in the next slide some of these different pieces here and then how to apply this because I don't want you guys panicking about this if you're looking at it and saying, oh my goodness, all of my experience is down at the exposure level. I wanna talk you through um, what these things do mean and the pathways to that. So. Um, going to move forward here. So here's what we have at the graduate school level. Uh, so graduate school, the level of study, if you are completing a major area of study in clinical neuropsychology, you should have a minimum of three neuropsychology courses, two clinical neuropsychology practica. Um, and so those practica should be defined as having someone who is a clinical neuropsychologist as your supervisor, preferably board certified. Um, and then additional coursework practica, didactics, and clinical neuropsychology, and a dissertation or a related uh, or, and, or research project in neuropsychology. An emphasis area is having two neuropsych courses and two clinical neuropsychology practica. Experience level is one or two courses and one clinical neuropsychology practica. Um, and so right there, kind of that defining thing, you want to make sure you have two neuropsychology courses and two neuropsychology practica, again, supervised by a clinical neuropsychologist, preferably someone who is board certified. Um, and the exposure level is one course or one clinical neuropsychology practica. At the internship level, the major area of study is going to be um, at least 50% of training in clinical neuropsychology as well as didactic experiences that are consistent with Houston Conference Guidelines for Knowledge and Skill. Um, emphasis level is 30 to 50% of experience in clinical neuropsychology supervised by a clinical neuropsychologist. Um, and then at the experience level, it is uh, between 10 and 30% and exposure level is under 10%. Um, okay, and then as I already went through at the postdoctoral level, you need to have two-year full-time or equivalent uh, formal training in clinical neuropsychology, but that is not all it should be. If your program or the programs you're applying to really have um, uh, only that and don't have the relevant educational opportunities and didactic format uh, and research activities, then it is not meeting the criteria for this major area of study. So, um, Okay, good. Uh, I was afraid that the graph went away and the, or the table went away in the back. What I'm delineating here is um, what should and is probably clear to you already. 
So if you want to get in to a postdoctoral fellowship in clinical neuropsychology, and your training has followed that exposure line where the red arrow is, you are probably not going to qualify for a two-year full-time program in clinical neuropsychology. Okay, I'm gonna come back to you guys though in a minute, so please just bear with me. For those of you who are sitting up in that major area of study, and you've done your, uh, both your graduate training and your internship training up at the major area of study, breathe, let yourself breathe, do a good job with your applications. You are probably, if that is true that you've had that and you've done a good job on those things, um, you're probably not gonna have any problems with getting, a, um, getting into a good training program and one that you're interested in working with. Um, Sometimes we have students who have all of that and then they're still panicking about they're not gonna get in. And, uh, um, and honestly, I understand the panic. Many of us were those students who panicked about those things too, but really that it's not, you don't need to do that level of panicking. How's that? So the next thing I wanna talk about though is the beauty of what the Houston Conference Guidelines has, um, put on us. Sometimes it feels like a burden, but it's really a wonderful thing. Houston Conference Guidelines and all aspects of our training guidelines have said that there are multiple pathways that you can get to be a clinical neuropsychologist. So if you had, and I don't have all of the different ways you could draw that yellow area, um, if you have had differing levels of experience, um, you can still get to that point. You just might want to fill in with other things, which I'm going to talk about. So if you, sometimes you'll have a student who came from a major area study in neuropsychology, and then their internship was not 50% or more because they actually did feel that they needed to learn more about just therapy or um, geriatrics um, or something, some other aspect of clinical neuropsychology. Um, that's okay. You can still get a postdoctoral fellowship with that. Um, or if you didn't have a lot of training at the graduate level, if you have supplemented for what you have missed um, and had adequate internship training, then you should be okay too. Okay, I put this slide in here. You guys can review it later. This is the definition of coursework. So sometimes we'll have people who will say, I did you know, 10 hours online of training in clinical neuropsychology assessment, and that should count. It doesn't, this is what counts. Um, your classic old school three credits, um, three credit hours for each counts as a class. Major area needs nine semester credit hours or more. Um, research, a moment on research. Uh, research is defined, um, well, first of all, if it can be neuropsych specific, great. If you have done a really great research study and it's not in neuropsychology, because you chose that later or because your school had really good research and something that was interesting to you and important, um, but they didn't have it in neuropsychology, that's okay. Um, but what you have to do regardless is uh, your research has to involve you. You as the individual selecting an appropriate research topic, reviewing the relevant literature, designing your research, um, so creating a research design, executing that research, monitoring the progress, evaluating, the outcomes, and then communicating those results. The dissertation defense is required. So you have to have done all of these things and you have to defend your dissertation. And it is preferred that you have a publication from the work that you have done. Not everybody who gets a, into a postdoctoral fellowship program has um, publications, but um, if you do, that is better. And it's best if it's in a neuropsych specific journal. So again, if you've done neuropsychology research and you've published in one of the preferred neuropsychology specific journals, um, that's great. If you have not, then try to think about how you can get that. Okay, so that kind of goes into, how do you get the things you don't have? You're listening to me and saying, I really, really wanna be a clinical neuropsychologist, but I don't actually have some of the things you've told me about. So as you're going through your application process, it's important for you to identify your limitations, preferably a couple of years before you apply, but even at the time you are applying, and develop a strategy to address them. Um, are you movable? And if you are not movable, how are you gonna solve that problem? Because right now, you cannot do um, an online or have um, extended supervision from um, 
uh, I'm blanking on tele supervision. Uh, we're working on that. AACN is discussing it, but at this point in time, it has not been um, accepted as a way to do supervision. So, um, so this is one of those pieces that if you can't move and there isn't somebody in your community who meets these criteria, uh, got to think about that one and maybe find, as I uh, mentioned, I'll mention again, a mentor who can help you think about that. Um, some people can't move because they have other uh, responsibilities or they have financial limitations that keep them from being able to move. These things are, again, something to work with um, uh, a, a mentor on how to maybe create something, talking with us. Um, there are opportunities to find people to help with supervision um, that can make that happen for you in your area much of the time. Not all of the time, but much of the time um, if you reach out and get the mentoring necessary to help you get that fellowship training. Um, so then the next piece, movability seems to be one of the major issues that limits students' ability to um, get a fellowship. And the second is too little training. So you have had, um, you haven't done research. Your program doesn't do research and doesn't require it, or your research has not been neuropsych related. You don't have enough coursework and you don't have enough supervised clinical experiences. Um, so identify those as your limitations and try to figure out how to fix those. Give yourself an extra year to get the supervised clinical experiences you need. Find somebody who you can go into their lab and do neuropsych related research, learn how to do research, create that project, do it, write it up. Um, take courses at neighboring universities that have the uh, required coursework for clinical neuropsychology. And that all comes back to that important point of finding a mentor. Um, if you are in a program that has a major area of study and, um, you know, and has all of the things we've talked about, then you don't need to look outside of that for a mentor. You have it right there. But if you don't, um, you want to find someone who preferably is a clinical neuropsychologist. Um, and uh, often the best way to know if someone is a clinical neuropsychologist is if they are board certified with ABPP in clinical neuropsychology, um, not with other um, specialized specialty boards. Um, and then if you have a focus, adult versus peds, the majority of fellowships do not um, have actual training for both adult and peds. So at some point you gotta choose. It's best to kind of figure that out sometime around the fellowship level if you haven't already. Your mentor can be along, the, uh, you know, be in that group because that helps them to help you figure out how to get what you need. Um, and then location may be an issue. So again, the um, a mentor by definition is going to help the mentee define and achieve their professional goals. Make sure that the person who is choosing to mentor you has the time to commit to mentoring you. And if they do not, then don't choose them because you do need them to put the time and energy into helping you define and achieve your professional goals. Um, and uh, again, there is this AACN student mentorship program which can help with this process. Okay, I am, I am finished with, finished uh, with that. Thank you, Dr. Heffelfinger. This is Dr. Harder again, and I just want to ask our um, our panel to turn their microphones on, and now we can move into some questions. Uh, we want to thank the audience for um, submitting several questions prior to this webinar. Um, we're going to do our best to cover um, as many of those as we possibly can in the time allowed here. Um, so the first question I'll direct to Dr. Heffelfinger, um, which is if an individual has a good amount of neuropsychology experience but did not secure a neuropsychology internship, is it discouraged to participate in the absin match? And in this case, it sounds like this person um, is having some experiences in forensic and neuropsychology um, during internship and then um, spending about 20% of time in these neuropsychology-related activities. So Dr. Heppelfinger, could you uh, talk about that? Sure. Sure. Uh, thank you for, uh, that, thank question. You for that question. And, uh, and uh, I'm getting... Okay. okay. And okay. so, and so, the thing with that, I've already explained a little bit. If you, if you had had graduate training, graduate training major area of um, study, 
and you are confident that you had all of those other expectations in the training or experiences in the training at that graduate level of study, and you are getting some neuropsych experiences at the internship level, then uh, I would encourage you to apply for um, the postdoctoral match and uh, uh, gra uh, training program at the postdoctoral level. If you're listening to me and saying, uh, I really don't have those things, that's not what my graduate's training did, then um, you, you can still apply and see and see how you do with that match because maybe your application will be stronger than you're concerned it will be. Go back to how to make your application show that you have all of those experiences that are needed um, to prepare you for the postdoctoral fellowship and really uh, ask someone to review your application, your application materials. Excellent. Uh, this next question I'll direct over to Dr. Miller. Um, what is the significance of um, APA accreditation at the fellowship level of training? Would attending a non-accredited fellowship negatively impact future career opportunities? So I, so I, so I think so that, I think that the uh, APA accreditation at uh, the internship level is imperative, it's required. Uh, the APA accreditation at the fellowship level is less common, you know, and many of those programs are, are often associated with the Veterans Administration and other programs too. But in my experience, and you know, uh, I'm talking to other colleagues as well, that does not seem to be detrimental in terms of your future career opportunities. And I think that many uh, ASM program directors are, are not APA members, actually. Great. OK, thank you so much. Um, Dr. Collins, this one is for you and is um, you know, similar in some ways to the previous question. Um, what is the role and or importance of having an APA accredited internship on the likelihood of matching at a fellowship? Uh, you are going to uh, get an APA accredited internship, um, and most sites are going to be very specific about this in terms of their application materials. Certainly, uh, VAs require uh, uh, anybody that's a fellow, regardless of specialty, uh, to come from a um, uh, an accredited uh, internship program, and. Um, this also creates issues, uh, although not prohibitive, but issues uh, with state licensures as well. So uh, for neuropsychology, it'll be very important. Okay, and then um, Dr. Heffel Heffelfinger, um, how common is it for students to fail to match at a fellowship but then apply again for a fellowship the following year? When I apply, will I be competing against these types of applicants? So, so usually, usually you will not win again in again the other situation. There may be a few, but typically, um, I encourage you if you did not match and you have gotten some of these experiences in this year to reapply uh, for sure. But the people that you will be competing against, most of them will be applying for the first time. Okay, great. And Dr. Collins again, uh, this question is about um, uh, fellowships that are uh, unpaid. So this person heard that some fellowships um, appear to be unpaid. Is this correct? Well, well it's, it's certainly not correct for uh, APSIN programs. It is, I assume, possible that if a person is applying to a program outside of APSIN that a couple could be like that. Um, I would have concerns about um, residents being exploited in terms of not receiving appropriate compensation uh, during their training terms. And uh, for anybody that's really applying and attending a graduate program, you want to make sure that uh, uh, the pay is really consistent with the uh, Fair Labor and Standards Act, um, which has actually resulted in a pay increase for uh, fellows and residents over the past several years. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Clausen, uh, please talk more about the National Conference on Neuropsychology Postdocs and Fellowships. I hear there is a large convention where um, a number of students are matched on the spot. 
please advise on how valuable it would be for students like me to plan to attend. All right, so um, there's several questions, I think, in this one question. First of all, there isn't um, necessarily a fellowship conference. Like we've already discussed, um, there is the annual meeting for the International Neuropsychological Society, and that is where um, interviews often occur. Um, there, like was also mentioned, uh, you can also do interviews via phone and Skype or on site, and you can contact the programs about that. Um, and at, the, at INS, when interviews occur, um, you don't necessarily match on the spot. Like was already mentioned, if you're in the match, um, the match date occurs later um, after the INS meeting and interviews. And um, the last question is kind of advising on how valuable it would be. I certainly think going to INS and doing the interview process is extremely valuable. It's very cost effective. You don't have to fly multiple places. It's time efficient. Uh, I think it's a great process and makes it a lot easier on applicants. Excellent, thank you. Um, and Dr. Miller, uh, I know this was touched on by Dr. Heffelfinger a bit, but could you talk about um, you know, deciding you know, how many residencies to apply to? Yeah, so I think that you know the the number that Dr. Helfelfinger mentioned was between eight and fifteen is a sort of a, a good general guidance. Although I think that you also have to think about what fellowships are a good match for you, and so I don't want. Um, students to feel they should apply to a lot more sites because they're low in numbers. If those uh, fellowships are not a good match for them or they just can't really foresee themselves being in a place for two years, you know, uh, related to geographical um, uh, restrictions and so forth. So, so first and foremost, look at residencies that have good match for you, uh, your interest, uh, and so forth, and then find out how many um, you want to apply to. However, I also want to caution that um, you don't want to apply to too few programs either. So giving yourself uh, lots of opportunities to, to match to a program. I think the um, average number of um, programs um, ranked by applicants is six for those that successfully matched. And there's always going to be the case that some some places will not grant you an interview. So again, you know, a number between eight and 15, it sounds quite reasonable. But I also think, which is also the case for internship, there's a diminishing return after that number. So uh, I don't think you're going to significantly increase your chances of a fellowship if you apply to something like uh, 20 or 25. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, Dr. Heffelfinger, how much time should residency programs allot for research activities? That's a great question. So for APSEN programs where uh, the, the pro all of our programs need to do at least 10% of research or make that time available for their fellows, Many programs do 20%, so one day a week. And uh, that's definitely something to talk about when you're doing your interviews based on what your uh, interests in research are and your experience in research are. Okay. All right. And Dr. Clausen, we had a question about the EPPP. Um, the question is Is it beneficial to take the EPPP prior to residency? Okay, so I think it's first most important to mention that um, taking the EPPP doesn't influence how a program ranks you. I was certainly never asked whether I'd taken the EPPP uh, when I was interviewing. Um, with that said, I think that um, it is a good thing to start thinking about. Uh, my current training program, due to some changes in billing, um, co billing laws um, in this state, they're actually requiring us to be licensed uh, within the first year and have incentives for that. So I think it's something to be thinking about um, as the next step in your training, but I think it's most important to really focus on applying for postdoc and the training, and then um, certainly something you can ask about during your interviews. Excellent. Well, this um, concludes our webinar, and we just want to thank everyone for um, tuning in, and we wish you the best in the upcoming fellowship recruitment season, and thank you to our panel.